Welcome to the Alan Elkan Interviews, an unprecedented window into the minds of some of the most well-known and respected figures of the last 25 years. Today we are in this amazing New York gallery where before there was another very famous gallery called Wildenstein mm-hmm. here, right? I mean, it's an historical gallery place in New York. And now it's called Levi Gorvin Dayan, right? Yeah. And uh, you have a, a show here. It's not your only gallery. You have many galleries nowadays. Only two. Uh, what is interesting is that yourself, you have a, an interesting background. I mean, yes. you started as a real estate landlord. Yeah. I don't know how you could buy a house with $30,000 borrowed by your mother in California, in San Francisco. At Chinatown, Los Angeles was Los a Angeles, place. Was- and uh, then it happened that uh, another art dealer became your tenant. Yes, Steve Hansen and Francis Stark, the artist, were my tenants and they lived upstairs. And What's his name? Kardensky? David Kordansky. Kordansky, yeah. David Kordansky. Yeah. So you were not really involved in the world of art before, right? How is your life? You had not an easy childhood, right? No. I kind of feel like I had to learn the things I did based on the necessity. I didn't really have choices to make. I had to make them. They were made for me and I made the best of my situations. And so my father was a cardiologist with a bad cocaine addiction. Early on, when he had opiates around the house or ecstasy, I would steal his drugs and sell it in high school. Those were my early beginnings of art dealing. So you, you, it was furnishing you <laughs> yes. what to do as a dealer. Right? Yes, I was. At the same time, your mother desperately drinking because of this situation. Yes. Right? Have you seen the movie Kramer versus Kramer yes. and Taxi Driver? My life, I say, is like those two movies put together. It was like this change California law, my parents' divorce. And um, we went from like the streets of Beverly Hills, you know, the 600 block, like this beautiful three cars, a Porsche, a Mercedes, you know, soccer mom and very opulent life, you know, going to the Beverly Hills Hotel for brunch every Sunday to some of the like saddest stories, you know, my father turned the water off, well, the, the heat, you know, in the house. And so we would like shampoo our hair, like in our swim pool. Because in California, you know, the water was warmer outside than it was inside. You know, I remember like there was a certain point where there's just too much shampoo and conditioner in the <laughs> swimming pool that we couldn't do it anymore. And, you know, my mother's from Kathy would go to the market, go to Ralph's and throw food over. Because if we left our house, we were squatting in our house. And if we left, the city was going to lock it. So we couldn't leave our house. We were squatting in the 600 block of Beverly Hills. And so it was this strange thing because we had all our stuff and we were like living in this amazing house, but we couldn't leave. You don't talk about this, about your parents, but your grandfather was a very religious Jew, right? So you had a a religious upbringing somehow, right? Yeah. Yeah. No, my father's parents were very religious. When my father married his first wife, she was not Jewish. And uh, my grandfather was financing my father going through medical school. And he said if, you know, he didn't get a divorce from this woman, this non-Jew, that he would stop supporting my father. And so my father obviously picked money over love and uh, any anxious, fearful Jew would do. And so she took the diamond ring and threw it in the ocean and uh, he married my mother. I'm sure there was some resentment. So you, you, you were the only child? I have a younger brother. A younger brother. Yeah, Matthew. Events made you decide to be a kind of an art dealer in the basement, right? Yeah. And you had this really good art dealers and then yourself started and uh, you became famous first in LA and then in New York because you have a nose. I mean, you knew how to pick good artists before the others. You yeah. understood African-American art yeah. before it became a fashion and so on and so forth. Yeah. How is this? How I, does it work? I fell into art dealing because nobody liked what I was doing. You mean your art? My own art. Why they didn't like it? 
because I wasn't being honest with it. And I was a terrible artist. I was doing it for all the wrong reasons. You know, I wanted, I was doing it when I was younger to be loved. I wanted to be loved. You know, I wanted to tell the world how fucked up my life was, you know, and um, these aren't reasons why people are going to love you back. You know, you have to be giving them something to like receive something back. And all my friends were getting love and they were getting art shows and they were making money and they were getting shekels and I was getting ignored. So I opened up an art gallery and I sold other people's art. And I think that being an artist, I was able to connect with other artists. And so I think it's that skill set that I had. I didn't realize at the time it was a skill set, but it was the artist that I loved and I connected with them. And I think it helped that I had an alcohol problem and a drug problem. You already had it since oh, the I'm, beginning? Yeah, I mean, you know, I got high on my own supply in high school. You know, I would start taking the ecstasy and the quaaludes and the cocaine, you know, myself. And it just carried on. You know, in a place like the art world, it embraces that type of behavior, you know. So I was able to sell art at three in the morning at clubs, you know, where I would write notes on the back of my hand, $25,000 with a 15% discount and a couple initials. And I would wake up in the morning with an extreme hangover in, you know, a cocaine hangover in a fetal position. But as long as I could read the notes on the back of my hand, I could walk into the gallery and give it to the register and I knew I made money. And so everybody forgave me and people even applauded me. And so I was a hero. And then you moved from LA, your city, you know, to New York with this idea of the pop-up space yeah. that is called the rented gallery, right? <laughs> yes. I mean, you were renting your gallery to European galleries mm -hmm. who didn't have a space in New York. And uh, so again, real estate and art go together. 100%. But at that time, for instance, someone who becomes quite important as an artist uh, and your friend like uh, Rashid Johnson yeah. will change your life in a way later. 100%. Right? How was New York at the time and how were you perceived or received in a world where there are galleries like this one, like Gagosian, like other big galleries, you know? You know, when I first moved to New York, What I was doing, there was kind of a place for it. And I were you already married? No, I no. was not married. I was a disaster of a human being. I was still in the throes of the addiction and my spiritual malady. And this is when Rashid and I became very close because I opened a gallery in Chinatown on East Broadway. And my gallery is on the sixth floor of this Chinese building. There was like a wedding photography studio below me, an accountant, but They would call me round eye. I understood ABCs, American born Chinese people. And we did similar types of business and it was handshake deals. And I paid my lease on time. I paid my rent and enough said, you don't ask questions and you go about your business. And so I did this and there was a bar called Good World around the corner from the gallery. And Rashid's girlfriend, wife at the time was the bartender there. And I could stumble home. I was living at the gallery at the time in the back room. And so we became close, fast friends. But at that time, alternative spaces worked in New York. Like, it was good that there was the high end, like, Gagosians. And, you know, Hauser and Worth wasn't even Hauser and Worth then. But, like, places like that. But there was space for the bottom end. And you needed it. And I remember... At But that's a kind of research, no? I mean, you were more into the trend yeah. of what was happening than established artists yeah. that are already It's, selling in the market. Exactly. At my first opening, and I barely knew anybody, I had Jerry Saltz, Klaus Diefenbach, Andrew Krebs, and Anton Kern, and I had all these people at my opening, and I barely even knew them. I just showed in a group show some, like, really good artists, and they all showed up because they were like, who is this guy, and why is he here in this location? 20, uh, this was in 2007. 20. I was, yeah, 28, 28, 29. I didn't know what the hell I was doing. It was an old prostitute Mahjong parlor that I just literally just knocked the walls down, and said open. But in that time, you forgot you being an artist yourself, right? You didn't... Yeah, I think instead of opening a traditional gallery, it was a way for me to still in the back of my head say, maybe there's a chance for me still because 
it wasn't a traditional gallery, so I didn't represent artists. So there's still a chance for me to sneak in being an artist because I was, you were an artist. I was an artist. Yeah. I wasn't making art, but again, I think I was able to connect with artists. And then you get married at a certain point, yes. right? You get married to Sarah Abel. Mm -hmm. Now you have three one children son and two twin, twin girls. girls. Yes. But at a certain point, you moved from the city yes. to Sagabo. Yes. If I'm not wrong, you went to see Rashid exactly. in uh, Bridgehampton, yes. right? Yes, yes. And something happened. Yeah, I pretty much my surrender moment, you know, my like come to Jesus moment. I saw the light. My life, every day I would wake up, you know, wondering like I was one day closer to death. My business was failing. I was hiding vodka in like my underwear drawer. My wife hated my guts. She said, only drink red wine. And I was like, I'm only drinking red wine. And I would take shots of vodka. Every once in a while, I'd take an Ambien. She's having like, children. Having children. So you were very irresponsible. Oh, I was a disgusting human being. No, I was disgusting, broken. maybe not. But I put everything above or below, you know, the need to numb out. And I had conversations with Rashid and he would say, like, maybe you want to take a break. And I would say, put the alcohol as my medicine. Look at my life, how terrible my life It's is. It's curing your craving. Yes, right? I need the alcohol or I will die. And he said, maybe it's not the medicine. Maybe it's the alcohol that's causing the pain. And in all of my honesty and every fiber of my bone, I believed in the time that it was the alcohol that was saving me. And so every that's day... That's what most drug addicts or alcoholics think, yes, right? Yes, because it tells you in your own voice. It tells you these lies in your own voice. So it's not even somebody else. It's your own voice telling you these lies. So how can you think that yourself is lying to yourself? This is the craziness of the disease, is that it's literally yourself lying to yourself. And so how can anybody else tell you the truth when you're lying to yourself? So it's only you who has to decide. Exactly. Right? Nobody that, can. That's why no one else can bring you to your knees. It's only you. And so I had that moment. And But we, something happened to help this. Uh, Awareness, right? Yeah, yes. What I had, happened? I mean, if you want to hear, I had a few bottoms, but I, we had this property in upstate New York and I was just starting to make drawings again. And I went upstate and I said to my wife, I want to go and make drawings away from all the distractions and from you who nags me wife and my children who they're not even two years old, but they're just harassing me and they want all this stuff from me, like food and love and Damn them. I, I want to make art. So I'm going to go to upstate New York and I'm going to make art because that's what I deserve. And I deserve it without you guys bothering me. And so I went up there with uh, two bags of organic turkey slices and a big bottle of Tito's vodka. And uh, I got my art materials together and uh, I turned on Leonard Cohen and I took my shirt off and I started painting and I uh, I hadn't realized it, but I had drank more vodka than I had drank in one sitting in a very long time. And I can drink you know, at this point, you know, and I was like, God, I, I need food. I'm hungry. You know, I'm not feeling so well. And I stood up and I realized I didn't, well, I didn't realize how much I had drank. And um, I tried to get to the house where my turkey slices were because I knew I needed something in my stomach. And um, I came to, I blacked out and I came to, you know, like scrapes and cuts and we were on this ridge and I could not make it to the kitchen, to the refrigerator, to get these turkey slices. And I came to, you know, with these scrapes and some turkey slices on me, you know, it, I don't think it made it into my mouth, you know. And I realized as I was driving back home that I didn't go up there to make art. I went up there to drink and be left alone. And it was that moment that I realized that I had been lying to myself, that that voice was actually killing me. And so I called Rashid on the way back, just crying, because I realized that I was lying to myself and death was upon me. You know, like there was no other place, but I had never had a day where I was not high. Like I didn't know what to do. And so in the rooms, you know, they call him the Eskimo. You know, he kind of led me to my life, back to my life.
And you bought a house in Sag Harbor? Yeah. 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 So, so I actually bought a house across the street from him. <laughs> I was like, I didn't want to leave him. I needed to be that close to him. That and I, you started painting. I started painting. And so I opened a gallery in East Hampton and I would paint in the basement. And so when clients would come in the door, I would hear them come in and I'd run upstairs and I'd sell other people's art. And they're like, oh, what are you doing? I was at like, oh, Har nothing. At Harper. Yeah, Harper. Yeah. Eventually, you know, people started to give me money for mine and started 2000 and then 4000 and then and every summer I would ask my wife, I'm like, I'm making some money. Can I stop selling art, other people's art? And she's like, not yet. We don't have enough money. And then eventually when David Kordansky offered me a show and said to her that he's offering a show, she's like, you're now allowed to close the gallery. What kind of paintings were you doing at the time? Oh, art. All of my art kind of like goes back to that moment when my parents got divorced. It was like a couple days, but my father had a nervous breakdown at the Beverly Hills Hotel. And um, I used the wallpaper, the banana leaves, you know, as opulent, the symbol of luxury and you've made it. When my father had a nervous breakdown and my mom was like, go chase your father, see if he's okay. I scraped my nails across that wallpaper because, you know, as a child, I don't know what the fuck is going on. And, and I remember my nails were bleeding and I had like the phthalo green of the leaves in my nails. And all of my art is about like that time. And now I use the same green when I paint, I get that same green in my hands. And now I'm like, it's like, I don't know if you want to call it like, I've empowered myself, but like I'm making money off of my trauma now. <laughs> you know, that you work with serpents and green mm -hmm. and you write words. I write words, yeah. On that background. Yeah, right? exactly. That you did for a while. And that's how it all started because it was like I had a story to tell and I came to it late. And it was like, I have something to say and I want to say it as quickly as possible. And so it was like, Here's the background, here's where it all started, and what do I want to say? What is weird is that uh, Kordansky says that somehow he works dialogue mm. with uh, Ed Ruscha mm. or with uh, Christopher Wood, mm. right? He says that. But in my mind, this writing on remembers me of an art figure that you might have known or not called René Ricard. Mm who was writing poems yeah. on, and he had also a drug story, yeah. you know, yeah, and so yeah. on and so forth. Were you aware of him and his work? Or yeah. Did he somehow influence you or not at all? Or no. did my, is it a wrong idea no. of mine? No, no, I love his work. And at the time I wasn't so familiar, but I think the contrast between my work and Rene versus an Ed Ruscha. I always think of Ed as a cool cowboy from Oklahoma where Rene and myself are like bleeding hearts. Like we wear our emotions on our sleeves. It's like the thing that you were running from, which I was, and I think what he was, is the thing that now we're proud of is our kind of badge of honor. And so you want to tell the world about it. So that you survived. That we survived. Uh, you are survivors. Exactly. And so you want to tell your story to almost like as service to other people. And so, you know, I love Ed Ruscha, but there's some things where I'm like, it's so removed where when I say, you know, Rene Payne, it's his heart, it's his love, it's his poetry, you know, the same with me. It's like, these are things my mother said to me, or these are my fears, or this is my like love. This is all of me. I'm not trying to hide anything. And know? how did you put together your family again, and you were able to quit. I think it's two or three years that you're out of alcohol and drugs. Yeah. Was it difficult? You did it by yourself? You went to Riyadh? What yeah. happened? So I did it through with AA. I had a sober therapist, and I have, you know, a great group of other men that I meet with every day. In the Hamptons? Yeah, in the Hamptons and New York City. And now we have Zooms that we meet, you know, every day. You still do it? We still do it. And we read from the big book. You know, there's lots of like the 12 and 12 and we share. And these you are do the 12 steps. Yeah. yeah. And these are things that I never was able to do as a younger man is sit in a room full of men and talk about 
me, my life, my fears, my insecurities. Like, and you do it every day. And now I do it every day. Like I found my voice in Alcoholics Anonymous and the deeper I get into Alcoholics Anonymous, I've gotten closer to Judaism too. Like the Torah and the big book, the word of Hashem. And one is written by, you know, a couple doctors, broken, drunk doctors in Ohio. It's the same to let go of ego and fear and to get present. You inherited, or at least your brother wasn't interested. Or, so I now know it is your brother because you yeah. told me you have a brother. Yeah. In some portraits of rabbis, yeah. you know, that belong to your family yeah. and that you had in the house. And if I am not wrong, that made you think that you should draw or paint rabbis. Yeah. Like, you know, you have... A great example, I mean, in Basel, there is a whole room of Chagall's paintings ah. in the consistory, in, what is it, yeah. with all these rabbis. Were you inspired by that? Yeah. What happened? Why did you paint rabbis? So... And when did you show them? Well... And who bought them? Yeah. <laughs> you know? These are all such real questions. So... I'm my, sorry, but... No, I love talking about this. I never thought it would be something to talk about. It was always... A thing that was almost like my private story and then it became something that I could talk about that people wanted to talk about so I'm overjoyed to be able to talk about it when my mother passed away we grew up with like a couple rabbi portraits you know in our home and when my mother passed away I said to my brother like do you want the recipes do you want the rabbi portraits and when I came to the rabbi portraits, my brother's like I don't want them I was like, I'll take them. And I hung them in my house. And I realized that when you go to people's homes today of my generation, you don't see rabbi portraits. But when I was young and you would go to my parents' friends' houses, you would see rabbi portraits. And it wasn't famous rabbis and it wasn't famous artists, but there was rabbis around but the Orthodox house. But Orthodox Jews, they cannot make images. <sighs> right, of the graven yeah. image. But Who is that I spoke to my rabbi, Rabbi Korn, about this exact thing, and he said, this is not idolatry because they're vessels of Hashem's word. So unlike idolatry, they are just vessels for the word of Hashem. And so we're not praying to these paintings. These are just representations of... Yeah. But I asked my rabbi, the same question. I was like, am I in funny territory here, mm. you know? And he said, no, I almost feel like I'm making an inadvertent mitzvah by doing this. So uh, to backtrack, I started collecting these rabbis and I realized I'm a big collector of Ben Sean, paintings, drawings, prints, books, anything Ben Sean. And I realized that in these auctions where I was buying Ben Sean, all these rabbi portraits were coming up and nobody was buying them. And so not even one bid. And so I thought, if nobody is going to buy these rabbi portraits, I'm going to buy them. Because where do they go if nobody buys these portraits? Like this whole generation are selling these rabbis. Like me, my brother would get this thing and then they would just sell them. And where do the rabbis go? So I have to be the custodian of these rabbi portraits. How many portraits I have hundreds now. Of rabbis? Yes. I would say over 300 now. Prints, paintings, drawings. Hundreds. So I start to take them to the house, then I took them to the studio. Now they're in my storage. I have them everywhere. And so eventually I was like, I'm a painter and I'm a collector of rabbi portraits. I'm going to start painting the portraits. And I had some that were my favorites. And so I was like, I'm going to take my favorites. I'm going to paint them. And after doing this for, I would say like six months, John Chime, who I have a very close, wonderful relationship with, he would always come by the studio and he never really liked my other work, my other body of work. He was never a fan, but him and I had a really nice relationship. And he was like, are these portrait paintings of rabbis, what are you doing? Like, it's like, eh, it's on the side. It's just a side thing I'm doing. It's just the love of the rabbi. You know, he's like, you need to show these. I was like, no, I, this isn't what I do. This isn't my art. This is, Private. Said, yeah, this is private. And he's like, we need to show these. And so we did a show of them there. And I said to David Cordancy, I want to do a show just the rabbis there. He doesn't like the other work. He's not trying to, this is just for the love of the rabbis. And they're like, okay, they gave the blessing. And all of a sudden people bought the rabbis. We added a zero to the prices of the original rabbis. And as Rabbi Korn said, you add a little love to it, a little life, a little like new color. And all of a sudden People that didn't have the rabbis on their walls, all of a sudden on Park Avenue now, they have 
rabbis on their walls again. The who built them? Like Jews, I mean, a couple non-Jews too, but like a generation that wouldn't have had rabbis. The, the younger people? Younger people. And so I was like, I'm doing an inadvertent mitzvah by getting Judaica back. back on the walls. But are you still painting rabbis? Oh, I'll never stop. <laughs> <laughs> but although it takes a lot out of me, it's like my neshama like gets, it's like, oh, as opposed to my other work, it's a lot. And what is your other work? It's like the balloons, the leaves, the, because I feel like I went so deep into the child trauma and like I use different paints with it. I make larger scale ones. When I do the rabbis, I'm painting with oil paint and I get really messy and I'm covered in paint. And, you know, sometimes I lose a painting. I'm like Francis Bacon in there. You know, I'm like, Trum. when I'm doing the other work, it's more like I'm an architect and I'm, I'm burning incense and I'm, I'm in a Zen state. But when I'm doing the rabbis, I'm fighting. I'm going to like battle. And so what kind of shows you have? So I've shown, you know, the, you showed in Hong Kong, you showed in those are my other bodies of work. And those are the ones I think that are more, I would say, digestible. And that's just part of me, too. But like, for instance, the show I just did in Los Angeles with David Kordansky, I mixed the two. It was the first time I mixed the two. I did 13 paintings of the leaves. And it was the idea of a boy becomes a man. So the text would start as baby boy, don't cry. And it was one year of a boy's life until he becomes 13. And then I had nine rabbi paintings. So the idea was that the boy becomes a man and can sit in the minion with the other men. And so I showed nine rabbi paintings. Plus he Exactly, him. because he becomes a man. And so to me, it was the idea that the viewer can enter the paintings, the leaves that they traditionally know, and then they could kind of enter the rabbi room. It was quite successful. And I think People understood it, and they understood that I also do the rabbis. My show that's upcoming in this gallery is sort of going to be all of it. When is it going to be? Uh, in June, the mm -hmm. first week of June. What are you going to show? Sculptures, paintings. I'm a little bit of everything. It's rabbis? Sort of, yes. I'm literally putting everything I have. It's like my whole journey. I think this is like the end of Act One for me in a certain way. I'm even setting up like my office in like their main painting gallery. I'm setting up my office. I'm going to hold my therapy sessions in there. I'm going to have everything I do in my normal life. I'm going to do there and I'm going to hold office hours. And if people want me to walk them through the show, I'll do that. Um, but I'm going to be here all the time because I want at the end of the show, it's sort of like here I am now. This is who I am. And But it's not a very long time that you are really declaring yourself as an artist no. and that you have now also success. I mean, it's, no, it's that's why there's so much work. Years. That's why there's so much work to be done. The question is, you were a kind of um, a talent scout and you had many black American artists. Uh -huh. In a time where there was not this fashion of today, right? Yeah. Where you have to be an American African artist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Unless they don't think of you. Yeah. But you are not at all an American African <laughs> artist. Yeah. So how are you accepted, you know, by the market as a very white Jewish artist? Why well, was this time this kind of new world opening and you? Let's, uh, I don't know if it's a fashion, it yeah, is, yeah. It is uh, an avenging, you know, injustice yeah. and so on and so forth, which you probably understood yeah, yeah. before the others. Yeah. So how do you position yourself in that? And how is the, I don't say the market is an ugly word, but yeah, how yeah. are the collectors, museums, yeah. people acting vis-a-vis -vis this? I mean, this is such a bigger conversation, but I think that, you know, I always say like, and I, obviously this is, up for discussion, but I'm like, I'm not white, I'm Jewish. And because I think American Jews have received so much white privilege up until October 7th for so long, and now American Jews are experiencing like the other. You started before. I started before, <laughs> you know, I've always been the other, you know, I've always been on the outside. Like I have always felt more comfortable or maybe because I was forced in that position as the other. My conversations with people about art and life, like I would rather sit in a room full of a bunch of Jews and blacks than really anybody else, to be honest. 
And this isn't like an intellectual or conceptual response. It's just like a humanistic, intuitive response. Like it's just where I'm comfortable. It's just where I want to sit. And so when I first met Henry Taylor and he was like barbecuing steak in Chinatown, that's just where I wanted to be. It's not that I wanted to work with a, you know, a black artist or it's just that I felt more comfortable with Henry Taylor than I did with like other people. Because maybe we spoke the same language, we saw each other the same way. He accepted me. I accepted him. He didn't judge me. I didn't judge him. He's my brother. He's still my brother. He will always be my brother, you know, and it's like... But in a time <clears throat> where people nowadays, since October 7th, yeah. in many parts of diaspora are careful about wearing yamaka uh -huh. or they take off mezuzahs from yeah. the doors and all that. How do you feel yourself in <clears throat> rabbis? Yeah. Who will want to buy that? I know. Now? Well, I was raised conservative in Los Angeles, and I studied at Yeshiva, Bala Tshuva Yeshiva in Jerusalem for over a year, and I decided to come back and go to art school. But when I came back, I was Shomer Shabbos, and I was wrapped into feeling, and I wore tzitzit. And for about two years after that, I loved it, and I was still learning Torah and Gomorrah, and I felt very connected in the world. And um, Eventually, I stopped. I entered the art world and I took off my tzitzit. And after October 7th, I was actually flying to Paris and, um, and I decided to start wearing tzitzit again. I had been wrapping tefillin right before that again, but I said, I'm going to put on my tzitzit. And my, my wife was like, you're going to fly to Paris and wear the tzitzit? This is great. What do you do? I was like, there's some, there's a call, you know, and, uh, there's something about, not really being proud, but like owning this. I have put the tzitzit back on and I have not taken them off since then. And um, there's something about owning this space that's very important. And it's not political, but there's this idea of the light, what it is that I am doing, what it is the responsibility of like the Jews about having the Torah. This is nothing new. This has happened before. This will probably happen again. Maybe it hasn't happened in my generation, but there are psalms for this. There's understanding. There's a history to reference. And so I have a responsibility as a living person to continue to be the light in this world. And so there's nothing to hide. There's nothing to be proud of or not be proud of. I just have to stay on course about what I was asked to do, because this is not about me. This is about something Nowadays, much larger. it's almost like being brave, right? Yeah, I mean, again, I think I'm here to serve. You got to serve somebody, as Bob Dylan said, you know, like, I'm here to serve. And so I just think that there's something bigger happening. And it's like, I just want to be the light. You know, I want to give joy to the world. I want to, whatever it is. And if there's trauma, there's generational trauma, geographical trauma, there is a uh, territorial trauma, there is religious trauma. I understand. I've gone through my trauma. But do you feel American? Have I ever felt American? I don't. Because America has a big responsibility on uh, its shoulders, right? Yeah. Vis -vis the Western world. And yeah. It's the flag of the Western world. So we watch America, you know, like uh, something. And also Jews, they came to America in order to be safe, right? Yeah. To, to start a new life. And now this is different a bit, right? Yeah. And just, again, like anything, I think that this is not a new, in terms of like the history of Jews, I don't think this is new. I think maybe this is happening in a new place, in a new location, and a new time, but this isn't new history. And how do you react to that? I keep on what I was... As an artist, as a person. I'm going to stay focused on what I was told to do, which is be the light. And that's all I can do. So in your work, there would be light. That's all I can do. And, you know, I could take care of myself and I can control myself, but I can't control others. My light can shed light where there is darkness, Baruch Hashem, but... I'm not going to try to control other people. But as you fell into very dark life for many years, 
thinking that drinking or taking drug was healing your craving. Yeah. And now you went the other way. How much important is in your life this coming back to the light yeah. vis-a-vis your work? Or is this one whole thing together? I think of it almost like a clock. You know, it's like at 12, it comes to one again. You know, it's a cycle. And at the end, it's to remember, you know, they say, I mean, there's a reason why it's a 12-step program too. You know, once you've gotten to your resolution and you've gotten to the top, the whole point of this whole thing is that you serve somebody else. You help somebody else. You lend your hand to another person who is sick and suffering. If you've healed yourself, you know, of your allergy, get to work. You don't sit around and celebrate your victory. You go out and help somebody else who is sick and suffering. And so it begins again. But the fact that now you're not only accepted as a human being everywhere, not only in this Chinatown Mm -hmm. world, you finally are accepted as an artist, Mm. right? So you don't have to hide anymore. You don't have to in the real estate anymore. I mean, if you want, you can, but it's not your major feel. I mean, you're now known as and accepted as an artist. Thank you for saying that. I still, that's what you feel. Yeah. At times it's sometimes. That's what you feel with how it is for you. Honestly, I don't have the space or the desire or the time to think about it or to worry about it, because all that does is take time away from the things that I need to be doing. Which is? To serve, you know. What about your kids, your children? And I serve them. I serve them. Now you like them. I love them so dearly. I miss them. My girls just got braces yesterday. Yeah, you know, I am here for them. I am here for so many people that I love and I care about. I'm here to serve, you know. It's not about me anymore. And do you think that this, this thing of spending part of your life mm. misbehaving, right? Is that yeah. yourself first, the society, your children, yeah. and all that, has been very important to form and create the person you are now? Very much. Because I many s- people don't have this I experience. Know. They don't know what it means to fall so deeply, you know, know. not only financially, but inside. Spiritually. You know, I often say that I am grateful to be an alcoholic so I was able to recover. I am also terrified, had I not recovered, what my life would have been. You know, you're afraid of relapsing? I'm not afraid of drinking again. I'm afraid of becoming a person full of ego and fear again. And so that's why every day- Full of ego because of your success. For any reason to think that like I'm in charge again. That like I have this in control, that I am I am controlling the ship. To think that, oh, look at me, I'm successful. I, I have things to say that I'm in control, that like I got this under control. I have nothing in control. I'm it's one day at a time. I'm grateful to be here. I'm, you know, here for other people. I don't have anything in control. It's just one step at a time. Do you think that other people have something in control? That's not my business. <laughs> <laughs> How do you help other people? Well, you know, you talk l- about you said a word. Yeah. You know, I wrote a book myself entitled Mitzvah, which unfortunately is not published in English, but is published in Hebrew, in Portuguese, and Italian. Right. And it will be republished now. I heard the word Mitzvah yeah. that you said yeah. before. So this kind of light that you want to give to the others is your mitzvah. Yeah. Basically. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that honestly, like last night there was this event and it was the art production fund. And and I felt like there was such goodness and there's such community and everybody I was interacting with, you know, when an event starts, people are kind of like stiff. And then at the end, people were like, walls were broken down. And like, it was almost like everyone was family, even people that weren't, you know, there were people at the table that were like restaurant tours that were like, and at the end they were saying, your children could come and throw spaghetti on the walls. And, and all of a sudden I had invitations where my children were throwing spaghetti on their walls. And at the start, it was a formal thing. And at the end, it was like we were laughing, joyful, and we we're hugging. And something broke down that we became like 
just people together. And the idea that there is a French prime minister and a German minister who say we have to prepare ourselves for a war, is it frightening you? Um, I mean, this world, as you said, you know, we're not prepared to this wave of anti-Semitism and it might have moved more somewhere else as many times it yeah. happened because it was in Russia, it was in Germany, it was in France, it was Spain. everywhere. Spain. Yes. Spain before, right? We were not used to think of a major war, right? In your generational mind. No. Right? Oh, no. And now it's not absolutely sure there will be a war, but the menaces of that. I mean, we talk about, we hear about this, you know, oh, yeah. somewhere there are wars. How do you feel about that? Um, I mean, you I, have children. I've always been of the mind that I'm glad when things come out in the open. I've known that this world is this world. It's just been under the surface. I'm not happy that people are dying, but I'm happy when things come to the surface. Like, it's time to start talking about it. So, like, I know that people say that, like, some things will cause more Hamas members. I disagree. I think that if there is a problem, this already exists. So perhaps you either need another avenue and it's maybe time to start talking about it or figuring things out. Or there's going to be so many wars that enough people die or but something needs to happen. Something needs to break. But this has already been there. Now it's just happening. The so you're not at all surprised by all what happens. Oh, no, it's just kind of a matter of time. It's just time is ticking, you know. Thank you very much oh, for this conversation. You. Thank you so much. Alan Elkan interviews.